So today we're going to go over chapter 19. We're going to focus on the under the microscope questions for this chapter. I thought those were pretty good. So we're going to do that. We'll break up into groups to find our, our things and then do a, a share. And then um, for lab, um, I know I have the presentations kind of sandwiched in between, but we're going to push those to the end of class. Um, so we'll actually do the under the microscope questions, then we'll do the lab, then we'll finish up with our presentations, uh, whatever we have time for in that last hour. Maybe we can make up some time in the air um, with that. And then for lab, um, I know we're only scheduled to do like the next two or three principles, but I thought we would just go ahead and finish them out. And then, um, tomorrow do like a comprehensive review. I have an activity for us for that. So we'll go ahead and do that. I have a video from the Surge Tech Tips guy about setting up the back table. Uh, it kind of stops abruptly, but um, he gives some good tips in there. Um, and that is coming down the pike for us, not, not too far away, not in 140, but in 120. Uh, and so we'll finish up the semester with all of those basic skills. So um, anyway, the more we can look at it and kind of prepare, the better. So that's going to be the plan for lab. And then we will go into our presentations. Um, it looks like there are four of you that have not yet signed up for lab. So I made the Google Doc. Um, those four, you probably know who you are, but Rulon, Sean, Gabe, and Rainey, as of 8.34 this morning, had not signed up. Those are the four outstanding ones. Um, the link is in the Blackboard um, on the announcement, as well as in the course content at the very top. So go ahead and do that. Um, I'm giving you guys until Friday, so um, that should be pretty manageable to do. So that is there. Um, and then before we start, um, do you guys have anything? I have a little poll, but let me see if you guys have any questions or comments or anything. Yeah, I, I got a question on the I know she, I just pushed the share button, I, like the ones I sign up. It's really difficult for me to understand, Rulon, what you're saying. Your audio is like really um, kind of dragging out. I'm not sure if there's anything we can do about that. Yeah, I don't know, why. I don't know how many do it. Sound better now? Mm. Not that much better. Do you want to put it in the chat? Yeah. Something about signing up, but I can't really make it out. Anybody else while Rulon is doing his typing? What are you spraying, Ariana? What's it, what does it smell like? It smells like roses. Yeah. My room has a, my room doesn't smell bad. I just um, lit, lit a candle and I put up, I just, put up my fire thing. So I lit it with a paper. So I just need to spray it out of the way so it doesn't like go off in the middle of class. Um, so signing up, you said you use the share button to save that you signed up for Tuesday in number five. Okay. Um, yeah, so you should be able to use the link and then hit save and it should be there. I can go ahead and put your name in Tuesday in slot five. Um, I don't have it pulled up anymore. Oh yeah, I do. Let me see. Uh, oh yeah, you're there now. You must have done it after 834. Must have happened after 834. Okay, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, you know, we'll work it out. Okay, all right, so you're there, Rulon, you're good, okay? 
You are good. I'm going to mark you off my list. Yeah. Okay. And I see Gabe there now. Gabe, you're good. All right. So it just looks like Sean and Rainey. Okay. So go ahead and put your names in there and we'll be good to go. All right. A quick little poll and then um, we'll get started. Let's see how I do that here again. Okay, so this is about SUR 140, which is our course coming up next. And uh, the question being, we have three hours of micro that day and one hour of SUR 140. So when would you like it? That's my question. Oh boy. What am I gonna do if it's like 50-50? I'll have to make a decision on my own. Still waiting for a couple more to chime in. Three more maybe it looks like. All right, I think that's everyone because 21 would be including me. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close it. So here's the results. 10% uh, more of you, 11, um, said from 11 to noon. Okay, so we're gonna go with that because it's majority vote. Um, that's what I originally had it scheduled for. I just thought maybe you guys might be thinking something different than me. Um, and it looks like some of you are. I thought maybe it might be better to just get it out of the way in the first hour and then you'd have the rest of the afternoon to do whatever else you had to do. But um, yeah, of course, um, you know, I, I learned a long time ago that the way my brain works isn't always how my students' brains work. So um, I like to pick your brains and figure that out. Okay, so we will keep it the way that it is just um, because of the majority vote there. All right, thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. Okay, um, so we're going to jump right into our under the microscope questions. I need to maybe get a bigger desk, stand up desk, because it's just nothing fits. Okay. Um, we're on page 291. Yeah, 291. So if you get out your textbook, if you want to turn there, and um, we're just going to go kind of go right down the line. Um, so let me break out, do the breakouts, and then each group will have one question. Pretty straightforward, okay? So let me cue that up for you. Um, how do I do that again? It hit it. Okay. All right, we're gonna do five rooms. All right, so my first group is gonna be Alexis, Jacob, Jonathan, Lixie, and Robbie. And so we went at the top last time, we're gonna go at the bottom. So Robbie, I'll have you be the lead in there. Let me write it down so I don't forget. I'm old, I forget things. Okay, uh, room two, Gabe, Hannah, Jackie, and Sarah. So Sarah, I'll have you be the lead in there. Group three, Ian, Ivana, Rainey, and Wendy. So Wendy, you're gonna be the boss in there. You can boss them around, okay? Um, uh, group four, Alyssa, Rulon, Sean, and Tammy. So we'll go with Tammy for this round. And then our last group, uh, Adriana, Ariana, Tallman, and Tori. So we'll do Tori for the lead in there. All right, so um, group one, Robbie's group's gonna have question one. Sarah's group, you'll have question two. Wendy, which is group three, you'll have question three. Tammy, group four, you'll have question four. And Tori, group five, will have question 
five. So who wants to just read the little intro first before I send you to your groups? Feel free to jump in. Ivan is a preceptor for surgical technology students rotating through the uh, cysto cystoscopy room. He explains that the procedure coming up is a cis uh, cystoscopy uh, with stent replacement to be followed by an extracorporeal uh, shockwave litho lithotripsy or ESWL procedure. The surgeon plans to perform a cystogram during the procedure and also orders urine culture and sensitivity. Beautiful. Thank you for being brave enough to traverse all of those big crazy words. Very good. Very good. Do we know what all of those words mean in there? Anybody have a question about what any of those terms are? If you don't know, somebody else probably doesn't know. So ask if you have a question. No questions? Okay. Um, so I will send you to your rooms. I'll give you about 10 minutes. I think that should be sufficient. Um, if your question would be best supported by an image, you know we like to see images. So um, I'll leave that up to you guys. And I'll call you back in about 10 minutes, all righty? Text me if you need something. All right, here we go. Hold on, I gotta get to the thing. Okay, here we go. Found out that hollow tube is with the lens inserted into the utero and it slowly events into your bladder and it's to, you could collect it in a urine in a cup. And then we found out some information. We were trying to figure out if it might be similar to it of like how it might look like. Um, it says lower and upper tract UTI infection has pus and bacteria. Mm. And it's, you can have blood in your urine, but like when they do the exam, they know for sure how it might look like. So depending on what exactly you're going for the procedure. And then we put that it might look brownish as maybe as well and then we just found like different information where it says of what it might look like as well and then we found out one photo but we're in it i don't know if jacob got the other photo but we have one of the photos that we could show you okay do you want are you gonna share it or jacob do you want me to share the photo that you put up or i don't know if you have another photo yeah you can go ahead okay then okay Hold on one sec. Okay, you are the boss now. Okay. We got the, wait, can you see it or is it too? Not yet. Oh, wait. Okay, I don't think I did it right. Oops, my bad. Wait, um, I think you might need to do it again, Ms. Spencer. Okay, let me try, let me see. Um, it says you're the host. Oh, okay. Let me see. Can you see it? Can you see it? <laughs> Doing something. Yes, we can see oh, it. Okay. So we got this photo where it shows like what they're using a catheter and then it shows like that. We didn't get to get another photo though, but we have this one. Okay. This looks good. This looks like um, an indwelling catheter. Mm. So if you see right here, it says water filled balloon. That's what gives us the clue that it's going to stay in there for a while because we, once we insert it, we blow this balloon up and then that's kind of what holds it in, right? So that it, I mean, if you pull hard enough, you can pull it out, but essentially that's what holds it in. Um, something else that they might do is um, just, uh, yeah, Tammy, that's exactly where I was going, my dear. Yep, you're absolutely right. So um, Tammy asked, would they just do a straight cath? And so the nurse could definitely just do what we call a straight cath, which is a, um, 
the catheter that doesn't have a balloon at the end. And so they just stick it in, get the specimen, and then pull it out. So that could be the, the um, alternative. Yep. Okay. Good job. You guys are so smart. I think you're in charge now. Yes. I have to reclaim. I have to steal it back. Awesome. Ah. Yep. So I think that was that was a pretty good overview. So straight calf and the nurse could do it, or we could take the specimen intraoperatively. Okay. If if the surgeon wanted to do it that way. Thank you. Yep. Good job. Any questions or comments about that before we move on to the next one? Violent reactions? Okay. Um, Sarah, your group had question number two. I'm gonna share my screen actually, because- uh, Okay. We, um, so our question is what type of procedure is a cystoscopy and what type of special instrumentation or equipment is used for the procedure? Um, okay. So this is, can you see that? Yes. Okay, so this is um, a back table setup for a cystoscopy. At least that's what it said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> I think that's right. what it is. Um, and then, let me give me one second. Okay. I'm trying to find, like, the notes that we had. It looks like they're gone. Okay. One sec. <laughs> Okay, so a cystoscopy is a procedure that allows you to um, examine and view the lining of the bladder, and it has a tube, like you said, on, attached to it that will, like, blow up. Um, you're able to, like, view the urethra and take the specimen, and then there's a little camera on the end of it, which is this, so then you can actually, it's like a, a scope, so you can do what you're doing. And then I think this is just saline, like a syringe of saline. And then um, gauze, obviously. And then I don't know what those are. Do you know what those are, Ms. Windsor? I can't even see what those are. Can you make the picture bigger? I'm old. Maybe. I'm going to try and just blow it up this way. It looks like clamps or some sort. I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't like labeled know. or anything, but... I don't know what those are. I can't really tell what those are. What I can say from looking at this setup is that there's two different types of cystoscopes. <clears throat> there is the flexible, which is what you see here, and there is a rigid scope. Um, and a lot of times for cystoscopy, they will just use the rigid one, but um, you know, it, I think it kind of, uh, defaults to surgeon's preference. And then this tubing that you're seeing attached to the actual scope itself mm -hmm. is uh, called cystotubing or um, I don't know, terp tubing, they might call it, but cystotubing is what I typically hear it called. And so this is going to hook one end to the scope. The other end we're going to throw off to the nurse and they're going to put it in a bag of, I don't know, glycine or saline or whatever the surgeon wants to use. <clears throat> and that is going to continuously irrigate the bladder as we're working. So it's going to help flush it out. It's going to help tampen out the bleeding. It's going to help open up the bladder so that we can see what's going on in there. Um, more than likely, this syringe right here is full of lubricating jelly because as we're working in orifices like the, the vagina and the rectum and the urethral meatus, we want to lubricate whatever that device is that we're inserting in, into there so that we don't damage the delicate uh, mucous membranes there. So my guess is going to be that that is lubricating jelly right there. Okay. Would you need anything else or is this like a standard? <laughs> This uh, doesn't look like very much. Um, 
typically we have like a cysto tray and it has like obturators and sheets and stopcocks and you know different instrumentation in it kind of just a basic uh set for like cystoscopy or ureteroscopy um so typically a little bit more than this this could be an office setup, honestly, they do cystoscopies in the office. So this could be an office procedure setup and not an actual OR setup. We have a tendency to go a little overboard in the OR, like it, make it feel like it's real surgery. Is this commonly done as like an in-office procedure? Or like what, what's the difference? When would it be done in the OR and when would it be done in the office? I think it depends on what the goal is. If the goal is just to take a peek into the bladder and kind of get a sense of what's going on, then I think it's doable in the office if you have someone that's of sound mind and those kinds of things. Um, but if um, we're going to be taking biopsies or we're going to be getting a stone out or, you know, doing anything else besides just a little peek inside there, then I would say it needs to be an OR procedure. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else in my group, but. I have a question. Yeah. Miss Windsor, actually, so in office versus in OR, um, what does that do to our sterile environment? You know, because in our sterile environment in the OR, once we get things set up and everything like that, our, our tables and stuff, um, we don't leave the room. And now is this a sterile setup as well in the office room? And can you shut the door and leave or do you got to stay there and watch the equipment? Um, I'm betting that they don't stay there and watch the equipment. Um, and really, this is considered a clean procedure and not a sterile procedure because the, the genitourinary tract isn't, uh, you know, I mean, where it opens to the outside, you know, deep, deeper inside the, the um, you know, the workings, yes. But, um, you know, my guess is probably the medical assistant or someone is going to go in, open these things up for the doctor, and then say, okay, you know, and maybe the, the patient's in the room by then, I don't know, you know, patient or, you know, doctor will be with you, and, uh, you know, maybe the patient's in there guarding it, but um, it really is just a clean setup, so, um, but, you know, they do little procedures in the office, or sometimes they have little procedure rooms, um, and the best practice would be to, you know, practice, dem demonstrate the practices that we demonstrate, but, um, you know, it probably doesn't happen as much. Yeah, good question. <laughs> All right, good job. Any other questions or comments about that? Very good. Um, remember also, just quick a quick side note um, for question two as far as equipment. Um, that scope that you saw, it didn't have a light cord or a camera attached to it. So um, typically there's going to be a couple other cords that we're going to be monkeying with on our field besides that cysto tubing. Light source for sure. You might have some old school surgeons that like to actually look through the eyepiece like this down between the legs. Um, I worked with one that was that way, um, but most of them will want to attach a camera to it. And then we're going to need whatever equipment it is that's, uh, you know, that it's attaching to a light source, a camera source. If they're using a camera, a video source, like those screens that we looked at in those OR rooms before. Um, so there'll be some other non-sterile pieces that'll also come into play with that, just as a side note. Okay, good job. Thank you so much. Um, question three, that was Wendy's group. And I have a picture to share too. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me do that for you. Wait, I have to reclaim the host. Okay. 
Okay, Wendy, you're good to go. Oh, nice. So that is a picture of the procedure. Um, so basically, an um, ESWL uses shock waves to break a kidney stone into small pieces that can be um, that can more easily travel through the urinary tract and pass from the body. Um, this is done, you know, the patient lies on a water-filled cushion and the surgeon uses x-rays or ultrasound tests to precisely locate the stone and basically, basically yeah, the mechanical blockage is um, the ureters that are being blocked by the kidney stones. Um, and yeah, that is it. Unless my team needs or wants to add anything. So leave the picture up for a minute if you would, Wendy. Um, so a lot of times you'll hear this referred to as an ESWL. So we typically don't say ESWL, it's ESWL is what we'll typically call it. Um, sometimes the hospitals have uh, rooms with this equipment in it. Other times they have to have it brought in special. This is extremely painful for the patient and it's not typically used just for one stone. It's typically used because they have many stones in their kidney. So that machine is going to go, this part that's um, the lower part is going to go up against that kidney and it's painful for the patient to receive this treatment. So they're going to be under general anesthetic. Um, as far as our role as the surge tech during the ESWAL, there's really nothing for us to do. We're gonna kind of just be hanging out, wearing our lead because there's typically C-arm is built into it. So you can see this monitor over here. So they'll do a series of shocks and they'll take some pictures and they'll do a series of shocks and they'll take some pictures. It could take a while. After that, then we're probably gonna do a cystoscopy and put a stent in there. Um, and potentially a catheter as well. Um, so those are some things that you can kind of expect if you see an s -wall is scheduled in your room for that day. Um, what else? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Questions or comments about that? Awesome, good job, good picture, Wendy. Wendy and team. Awesome, SWAL. What does it stand for? Extra corporal, what? Shockwave, lithotripsy, right? It's sad when you guys make me answer my own questions. Okay. Um, group four. Group four, question four. That was Tammy's group. Yes. I'm going to attempt the, can you attempt the share screeny thing again and I'll see what I can do? <laughs> yes. Let me make you the hostess with the mostest. There we go. You are now the host. Share screen. Okay, so we'll try this first. Um, so Alyssa found this picture and it just kind of touches on what you were saying before was how the kidney stones are actually in, um, in the kidney themselves and where the lithotripsy would take place. So this is kind of a nice demonstration of, of them being stuck in there. Um, and then as far as our question goes, these are the pictures we got. So the purpose of the stent placement is to hold the ureter open and maintain proper drainage of urine. And this might be something that is temporary or it can be a long-term type of thing. But we were kind of, the question got raised as to what would cause the ureter to 
not stay open. And mm -hmm. the only thing that we thought of was possibly damage to the ureter, um, maybe from the stones passing through. But as you can see here in these couple of pictures, it looks like the stint's showing up there on the x-ray. I don't um, think we're seeing the, the stent, Tammy. I'm still seeing the kidney stone pictures. Are you? Okay, yeah. let me take a look. You might have to stop and then start again. Okay. Try this one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Okay. Yes. So, oh, that's not my document that I wanted to share. One moment. I'm not very good at the sherry thing. <laughs> uh, here we go. Now we're seeing a document. Good job. Hey, okay. there it is. Okay. So, so here, here, do you see these x-rays here? Yes. Okay. So these are the x-rays where you can see the stint that starts up in the kidney here and then goes down to the bladder. And this one you can see it's coiled up and then comes down. This is an actual picture of what they showed as a stint. I thought it was pretty because it was shiny and blue. <laughs> um, and then this is another picture with some anatomy of how the stint goes from the kidney down into the bladder. Yes. So to answer your question, um, and I think your, um, your hypotheses were, were good hypotheses. One other thing that I could think of is um, when you monkey around with the ureter, it gets mad. And so once you start monkeying with it, you've already ticked it off. Um, and so what we do at the very beginning of a cystoscopy, hmm, yeah, I, anytime we're going into the ureter, not so much if we're just staying in bladder, but if we're going into the ureter or into the kidney, the very first thing they do is they're going to take this long wire called a glide wire, and they're going to insert it all the way up into the ureter, into the kidney, and they're going to use a hemostat and they're going to clamp it to the drape you don't wanna pull that out because that is what keeps their pathway between bladder and kidney. Because once you start monkeying around with it and it gets angry, it starts to constrict down. Kind of like blood vessels. Blood vessels will do the same thing. When you start monkeying with them, they're like eh, and they, they start to constrict down. And so with vessels, we'll inject something called papaverin, and that helps to relax the smooth muscle of the wall of the vessel. Now, we don't do that with the ureter, but we want to maintain that pathway because if that wire comes out, there's a good chance that we're not going to be able to get back up there depending on how irritated it is at us. So that's one reason. Um, I think that also, um, and I'm not 100% sure about this. This is just my like educated guessing, but passing a stone is worse than birth. I have heard. I haven't passed one on my own, but um, done it twice. Yeah. So my, my friend thought she was in labor, like with her first baby. She's like, come on, honey, we got to go. The baby's on the way. And it turns out it was a, a kidney stone. Um, so she said when labor did finally occur that it wasn't nearly as painful as that stone that she passed. So um, all of that gravel is going to be passing down through the kidney and it's like little sharp jagged crystals. Um, and so it probably helps the wear and tear on the ureter and probably cuts down a little bit on the discomfort, maybe, would be another guess. Um, what else can we say about the stent? Um, why do you think it has those little piggy tails on the top and the, on each end? That I do not know. 
Anybody else have a guess? So the reason why there are the little piggy tails is to hold it in place, basically. Yeah, so that it doesn't get pulled out. When you work with a stent, you're gonna get the stent. Yep, it's just like a fastener, Ian. Um, there is a long little, um, kind of looks like a nylon suture that's attached to the end, the end that's gonna be in the bladder. So essentially what they could do, um, most surgeons want you to cut that off, um, but some surgeons will leave it on and it actually comes out the urethra, forgive my analogy, kind of like a tampon string. So if they wanted to, they could pull it out in the office. Probably not that fun. But uh, yeah, they could. Um, a lot of times they bring them back into the OR and we pull it out or they do a stent exchange. We'll take one out and put another one in for whatever reason, I have no idea. Um, but um, yeah, so it could potentially be taken out in the, in the office. Um, yeah, I think that's about I think that's about it about stents. Any other questions or comments about stents? The stent is like a hollow tube um, and that wire that they put up initially, they're gonna insert it over the wire and they're gonna let that be the guide to guide it up into the kidney. And then when they're all done, they'll pull that wire out. They'll use that. And um, in with the stent also comes, some, comes something called a pusher. And the pusher is like a little hard straw that will follow the stent. So once the surgeon loads the stent on the end of the wire and gets it up a little ways and the wire's coming out the back, you'll take the pusher and you'll start loading it on for the surgeon. And then that pusher will allow them to push the stent up into place the pusher. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm done now. All right, last but not least, number five, Tori. That was your group. Yes, and I would like to be host with the most, please. Okay, let me get that queued up for you. Okay, you are good. Cool beans. Okay. So we were the necessary PPE for a cystogram. So we said uh, the usual PPE, so gown and gloves, um, surgical mask, uh, some type of face shield or eye covering. Um, and then I also said uh, a lead vest or radiation protection of some kind. Um, and then for pictures, so that first one up here is going to be um, the actual cystogram with the image, images there of the bladder. And then it was hard to find a picture of PPE for a cystogram with like the lead vest and all of that. So this looked like it was some imaging. So I went ahead and chose this guy um, with the usual PPE gloves, gown, face shield mask, uh, hair covering. Um, and that's what we got for that. Awesome. Yes, well, most definitely, if they're going to be taking pictures, we want to have our lead. So I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in here. <laughs> um, you don't need a mask to do a cysto. So you probably should wear one because it's like waterworks and you could get squirted in the face and or in the mouth or nose with fluid that's coming out of the bladder. But don't freak out when you see personnel coming into your operating room uh, for a cysto or a ureteroscopy and they don't have a mask on. Okay. Uh, some surgeons choose not to wear masks. I've seen them get squirted in the face more than once. Uh, so, uh, yeah, dear, one of my, <laughs> that is nasty. One of the surgeons that I worked with in my past, 
he um he didn't wear a mask and he was old school he didn't use a camera so he would sit between the legs on a stool and he would look through the eyepiece like this and one particular time patient had a spinal so they kind of give them something to keep them a little bit sleepy but they're kind of awake off and on and um he was uh pulling out the scope and there's like an obturator that's left in there like a little metal tube pathway through the urethra into the bladder outside to inside and the patient started coughing and as i explained before we use continuous irrigation in the bladder and so the patient starts coughing fluid starts like squirting out of the obturator of the obturator and um so i thinking quickly, I thought, and being pretty, feeling pretty smart about myself, I just put my hand in front of the end of it, you know, so that he wouldn't get sprayed. And he started like swatting my hand away, like telling me not to do that. I'm like, okay, well, I, if you want to get pee in your face, then I, okay, that's great. But it didn't seem to bother him at all. I, I'm not sure what, I try not to read into that too much. Um, Oh, you did, Jacob? You watched a live one? <laughs> I guess he might have kind of been into that thing, Tori. Yes, it's kind of strange. But um, yeah, uh, I was looking through the surgical uh, tech tips videos and there was one about something about surgeons being crazy or are surgeons crazy or something like that. So uh, we'll probably have to watch that here before long. That looked interesting to me. Um, Okay, awesome. Yeah, so um, that's pretty much it about a cysto. I have a video. It's like about five minutes. Um, it shows a laser, laser lithotripsy. So typically they use a homium YAG laser, and it's this long, flexible laser fiber and um, it's going to go up into the ureter, and they're going to use it to bust up the stone. Um, so I thought we could watch that um, and then we'll take a break and come back and do some lab stuff. Okay. All right, let me get that queued up for you. Oh, I got to steal back the hostess from you, Tori. All right. Let's see. Um, All right, I know there's a way to get that little gray strip to go away, but I can never remember. Okay, here we go. So did you see that little metal tunnel that they went through? That's that, um, the sheath, the obturator is actually the thing that goes down the middle, the sheath is the outside. So um, the sheath stays in the patient and uh, the scope locks into it uh, as well. So here we're in bladder now. It's got nice steps for us. So if we want to do this in our garage later, we can. So that's the wire, the, the, that glide wire, and that opening is the opening to the ureter. So now they're probably going to switch to a flexible cysto or a flexible ureteroscope, which looks like that flexible cystoscope, except for it's longer so that they can see up into the ureter, see what they're doing. That bluish thing on the top. I believe is the laser and that green thing on the kind of 11 o'clock is the wire that goes all the way up to the kidney. So there's the stone. See it and all its glory. Take notes so that you can do this on the side later in the garage. You're going to zap it. It'd probably be kind of fun, actually. It's kind of like video games. 
See it? Zap, 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 zap. That little green light. It's like a meteor, but very small. So for us, we're going to have to mess with that laser fiber and it is super, super delicate and it's really out of control. Like it's really wiry and it's really long and you don't want to bend it because it could break. Um, and to keep that thing in control, not break it and not contaminate it, that is a feat in itself. Um, typically, there is a laser safety officer at your facility. Um, if they don't own a laser, then they're going to have a company bring the laser in, and that person is going to be kind of like your device rep. They're going to run the laser, all that fun stuff. Also have these long little wiry things that are called stone baskets. If you've ever seen like a pickle grabber, um, it kind of looks like that, where they'll run it up next to the stone and then there's like a little handle um, and this little grabby thing comes out and will grab the stone and pull it out. That might need to be sent for specimen. Here's an important thing you need to stash away in your head that these stones cannot go in formalin. They typically put them in alcohol. They can't go in formalin because formalin will break them down. So the pathologist is just going to get a jug of fluid if they're put in formalin. Bits and bits and bits. Just chasing it up the ureter. And look like tiny little bits of gravel when it comes out. Really small. Let's see, we're almost done here. Um, I think he puts in a stent. Let me see, he, she. So they'll flush out the bladder. If there's any gravel, they're gonna ask you to scoop it up. One thing too that you wanna keep an eye on is the fluid. Even though the nurse is gonna be changing the bags of fluid, if the fluid runs out intraoperatively, it's a pain. So you kinda of wanna keep one eyeball on the bag and if it's getting close to being empty and your nurse isn't paying attention, then you might wanna clue them in. I wasn't very good about the stent placement, but um, anyways, you kind of get a sense of what ureteroscopy is all about. Okay, questions, comments about that? All right, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. I have five after, so if you want to come back at a quarter after and get ready to take some lab notes. Okay? All right, I will see you at 1015.
Okay, so finishing up the last two principles regarding sterile to sterile. And then we will look at the non-sterile to non-sterile ones. <clears throat> so the last two that we have uh, are uh, ones we kind of mentioned briefly yesterday, talking being kept to a minimum. Talking being kept to a minimum uh, serves a couple purposes. One, there's not a lot of uh, like aerosol droplets, uh, reduces the chance of that. And also because your mask fits up against your face, as we talk, our, um, our face moves against our mask and that can cause sharing of those dead skin cells. And so dead skin cells could essentially fall onto the field. So um, aside from the fact that's just, I think, blatantly obvious of if our mouths are doing this, we're not able to focus on our case, right? So, um, you know, communicating intraoperatively uh, about what is going on is one thing, um, but just chatting to chat is totally another thing. But you're going to see that out there. 
you know, they're going to be talking about their day and their, their weekend or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but we just want to be able to give all of our focus to our patient. And one of the ways to do that is to just kind of focus on what we're doing. Um, in addition to that, we want to make sure that we wear it over the mouth and the nose. Um, and when you put on the mask, the bottom tie should go around the neck and the top tie should come up over the top of the head like this. If you're doing them both kind of down low like this, you're going to get this big gap right here and you really want it to kind of fit snugly against your face. Okay. Um, another thing you don't want to do with the mask is when you leave the operating room, just untie the top ties and leave it hanging down right here. It needs to be either on or off, all right? Um, unless you wanna save some snacks in there for later, like put some chips in there when you're in the lounge. Um, but, you know, it's best practice to take that off and not just go walking around with it. Um, questions about that? about talking, being kept to minimum, any of that fun stuff. Okay, pretty straightforward, I would say. Um, okay, non-sterile individuals, we already talked about this, staying 12 to 18 inches away from anything that is sterile, all right? And when you start out in your clinicals, um, all eyeballs are gonna be on you to see if you know what you're doing, even if they don't practice it, right? Um, they can be right up against their field opening stuff like this and it's perfectly fine. But if they see you doing that, they're gonna think, oh, they don't know what they're doing. So, um, you know, Ms. Jackson always talks about exaggerating those principles so that they really can see that we understand that where those perimeters are. Um, so that's what we're gonna practice in the lab. We're gonna make sure that we're 12 to 18 inches away when we're opening things. And that means things are probably uh, gonna fly off the table a lot, but that's okay. We'll get better, there's a learning curve, um, but we really want to exaggerate that. And then, you know, there, there's room to get a little bit more comfortable, but um, best practice is that 12 to 18 inches away. Moving into some non-sterile speak, uh, we said, Sterile can touch sterile and non-sterile can touch non-sterile, right? So, um, but when sterile touches non-sterile, then we have a contamination. When we are not sterile, we don't want to extend over a sterile field. And I think I've mentioned this before that, you know, the circulator works in a non-sterile role and they get us everything that we need. So intraoperatively, if we need another stitch, we need more fluid, we need sponges, we need an instrument, whatever the case may be, they're gonna be opening that up for us, right? And we want to, um, <laughs> I was thinking of a term that I probably shouldn't use. We want to help them not be tempted to reach over our sterile field. And the best way to do that is to either reach far over our sterile field ourselves, or to walk to the end of our back table so that they will walk to the end of the back table, right? So that you can reach, they can reach, and you can reach, and you can get whatever you need. So without even having to say anything, if we just move our bodies, they'll just naturally follow. They won't be like, oh, wait, come back. Why, why, you know, where are you going? Um, if it's just a little bit of a step to the right or to the left. So that's kind of how I avoid having to have that conversation of, hey, don't reach over my sterile field. That's bad practice, okay? Um, avoid reaching over a sterile basin. So when you're pouring fluids, a non-sterile person is going to be pouring the fluids onto the sterile field. When you have something like a saline container and it has like kind of a bigger open mouth on it, you only want that edge where the fluid is pouring out to actually be over the um, receptacle that you're pouring into. Um, now, what we will do quite frequently is sit something on the edge, 
right? Like we have our back table um, and we want them to pour our saline. We will verify the label, we'll, what it is, we'll make a label, we'll stick it on the bucket and sit it in the corner, the very corner of the back table. And the nurse can come and pour it in there, but they still want to stay 12 to 18 inches above. <clears throat> I don't know if you noticed in the video that we watched yesterday, but there is about this much room between where he was pouring and where her bucket was, right? You want to be up here. Now, uh, 18 inches away, a foot and a half, I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that, but so, um, on the test, if it says how far do you stay away, it's always 12 to 18 inches. In practice, it's probably more like six to 10, right? But you want to be above that container um, just so that we are keeping our distance. And again, like we said, once we open it, we don't wanna recap it. And once we start pouring, we don't wanna stop pouring, right? If we stop pouring in the middle, we can't start again, it's done. Okay, it's finished. Okay, questions so far, comments? It is really hard to hit that medicine cup with a small vial. I'm just gonna point that out. Um, okay, and so the last one, when draping a non-sterile table to create a sterile field, the non-sterile individual should cuff the hands on the underside folds. So remember when we saw um, two different versions of opening that pack up on the back table, right? One where the back table is long and the pack opens this way and there's a cuff, right? So you go to the end of the table and you pull towards you and you go to the other end of the table and you pull towards you, but there's those cuffs there. Everything that they fold or package prior to, or wrap prior to processing has these cuffs. So when we're not sterile and we're opening them, we put our hands underneath those cuffs and then that's how we open. Remember the second one was long. And so you go to the end and you open this way, right? We talked about um, opening wrapped items right where there's those little cuffs the little corners that are folded back where we work from those corners right same concept there um and then we also talked about how that first flap is going to go away from you right first flap is always going to go away then our sides and then the last one is going to come towards us that way we don't have to reach over whatever we have exposed in our sterile field right and we're going to get uh in the weeds with this a little bit um, when we start sur 140 so uh, right off the bat we're going to do hand wash open glove so you're going to be putting some of those practices into place um, working with the cuffs of the the wrapper of the gloves and um and then also when we do catheterization towards the end of the class um you will be establishing a sterile field um those catheter trays come wrapped and we will have to unwrap them properly to be able to get in there to do what we need to do okay what questions do you have I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see everybody. Hello, everybody. I can see you all now, it looks awesome. No questions, no comments? Kind of a review? It sounds so simple. It's gonna be interesting seeing what fumbles I make when I actually get to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can remember the very first time I was teaching scrub gown and glove, and uh, so I'm telling the class, you know, how you position the gown. And so I open the gown and then I have my packet of gloves and I'm telling them about that. So I go to open my package of gloves and just like that one guy in the video, they go right on the floor. And I'm like, yeah, well, this is just confirmation that even after you've been doing this all these years, you still are going to miss the mark every once in a while. <laughs> But I was like, oh, I was brand new. And of course, any little mistake just felt like this 
huge thing, you know? Now I just be like, nah, whatever, you know what happens, but that was crazy. Um, will we be going over the labs we did in SUR 100? Um, probably not. Um, not in a formal fashion. So in SUR 100, um, you know, we looked at um, the instrument pan and we looked at how you assemble instruments and putting those together and those kinds of things. You will be doing those a bazillion times before you leave us. So not to say that we're going to sit down and say, okay, let's review, but you're going to be practicing those things. So at that point, it's going to be my job to just guide, remind, facilitate, you know, maybe a quick little, okay, remember this is how this works kind of thing. But other than that, we'll just kind of move forward with the doing, the practicing. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Good question. What other questions you have? Okay. All right. Well, let's watch a little video. This, this Surge Tech Tips guy, this video just like ends and you're like, oh, okay, I guess he's done. It's weird, but I think the information he has to offer is helpful. So let's watch this. So today I got the okay to finally record in my hospital, which is awesome. I wanted to make a video about our back table setup. Back table setup, we'll, we'll talk about the Mayo stand, kind of little tips and tricks that I've found out over the years. And I want to break down the back table. Uh, we're, we're going to be talking about our, our working area. We're going to be talking about our instruments and, and excess. You know, break the table into three. Here we go. I love that advice. I do the same thing. I actually draw lines with a marker. So let's talk about our working part of the back table. This is our working field. Consider this one third of your back table. You want this part of your back table as close to you as possible when you're standing up at the field. We have our needle magnet. Some people like to you know, have their needle magnet up on their Mayo stand. Sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't. It just, it depends on the case and how many needles I'm gonna be working with. And sometimes you may have one for each. You may break it up and have one piece of your needle magnet here and one up on your Mayo stand up above. I usually have, yeah, you know, this is a vascular case, so I have peanuts and, and suture boots. But again, the, the most important part of this working field is having your sharps close to you. You want all of your sharps to be as close to you as possible because one of the things that we do not want to happen is somebody to get sick. <laughs> Nobody wants to get sick. So keep all these sharps as close to you as possible. Uh, and hopefully that won't happen. Or hopefully that will, you know, reduce that occurrence. Okay, so I'm going to ask you really quickly, can you identify any instruments that are laying here? Is that a number three long? A number three long. Awesome. Yep, right there. Number three long. Good. What the else? Skinny ones are number uh, sevens, right? The skinny ones. Yeah, those ones. Number sevens. Excelente. Anything else? I don't know if those are skin hooks. Right here, I think those are skin hooks, yeah. It's kind of hard to see the ends. I can't blow it up, but mm -hmm. Awesome. Are those needle holders? Right here? Yeah. Yeah, they're little Webster needle holders, they're called. Mm -hmm. Good job. Anything else? 
finger. Stuck in the back, your ankle. Back here? Yeah. Uh-huh, the yank hour and the graduate, yep. It looks like there's a disposable and a non-disposable, huh? Good job. Can you identify any of these right here? Like this one? It looks like there's one, two, three different flavors up here. Blades? Yeah, right, scalpel blades. Anybody remember what the bigger one is that fits on the number three, the biggest one? The 20. That one fits on a four. <sighs> remember 420. Isn't it 10 then? A 10. Yep, yeah. you got it. That one, and I think this one is, is the 10. That's what about the, this one? This. That one? Yeah, the skinny ones are 11s, right? Yep, and typically what handle do they go on? 7, 7, 11. Yep, 7, 11. They can fit on the 3, though. You'll have some orthopods when they do scopes that um, they'll want the 11 on a 3 handle. And then what's this last one? Anybody know that last one? Going once, going twice. That guy is the 15, 15 blade. It's got this smaller little belly on it. Um, and it can fit on an 11 or, or it can fit on a seven or a three, but typically we um, put that on a three. Okay, good. We usually, I usually have my basin set with, you know, saline, heparinized saline, whatever case I'm going to do, GU saline, doesn't matter. My basin set, I, I always have a kidney basin as well to throw like some excess syringes or anything up there. Uh, sponges are always next. If it's a small case and I don't have a lot to put in here, I'll just throw some sponges in my, in my uh, kidney basin. But again, the most important thing, we have our sharps. And we have our sponges. Those are the things that are going to be as close to you as possible when you're standing up at the field. This third of your back table, these are the most important things that you're going to be using in that case. Yes, you may have a five stack of laps up on your mayo, but you're not going to have 20 laps on your mayo at the same time. So you'll eventually in the case, you're going to have to go back to your back table and grab some extras. It's important that they're as close to you as possible so you're not stepping and trying to reach all the way across the, the back table field, trying to reach something that you're gonna need throughout the case. Towels, towels don't really matter. They can go anywhere. I just put them there for this case. Our other two thirds of the back table usually consist of instrumentation or, or implants, depending on the case that you're doing. Any instruments there that you can identify? Get out your eagle eyes and see if you can see anything. Maybe this thing right here. I see Army the Army Navy. Navy. Yeah. Okay, Good I'm job. Sorry. Yep. Army Navy. Is there anything else in there that you can see? I see a couple Wheaties. You see some Wheaties? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right over there. There's like a whole gaggle of them. Very good. What about, do you guys remember what this one is right here? Or there's two of them? A ribbon? Yeah, very good, excellent. A ribbon or malleable, sometimes we call them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this looks like a vascular setup. So it has like vascular dilators, um, this uh, fin and shadow looking thing, I don't know. Um, some various clamp, um, vascular clamps. But yeah, I think those are the things that are kind of the most viewable. Yep, good job. For this one, this, this is a hard setup for us, and we like to have our roll towel here. We have another roll towel with extra instrumentation in the tray, and we, so we keep both of these trays. That's common, but trays can go anywhere on a back table, to be honest with you. 
All right. <laughs> so that's kind of the premise of the back table setup. Your working feel, your instrumentation, break it up into thirds. And really, the working field should be as close to you as possible. Now let's move on to the baby brother, the mayo stand. <laughs> the beautiful, beautiful mayo stand. This mayo stand is where you are going to keep all of your instruments, sharps, needles, and clips, anything that you're going to be utilizing in the case. Basically, you want 90% of everything you're going to use on a case, you, you want to try and have on your mayo stand. You, you don't want to constantly be going back to your back table, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You want it on your mayo stand. You want it readily available for your case. So let's, uh, let's set this mayo up. So for a basic setup, well, I wouldn't say this is basic. This is basic big. This would be for a big case. Big case, just use a roll towel. If you got a big case, you got a lot of instruments that you're going to be, be putting up on that mayo stand, rather than putting them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and taking up your entire mayo stand, just do a roll towel. You can easily put them up there nice and neatly. If I have a case with a lot of suture, I will make a suture towel. Usually 20, 20 or more sutures, I'll just make a suture towel. It's, it's very easy to keep your sutures organized if you have a towel and you're able to just position them, you know, accordingly, depending on how you're going to use them or where you're going to use them. You can just place them all the way down the towel and it's simple. So forceps and scissors, forceps and scissors, scissors, you could put up on the roll towel, but for this case, <clears throat> I find it, I find it easy to have my scissors and my forceps easily accessible on the side of the Mayo stand that I'm going to be working on. We're on the, pulling up to the patient's right side. So I'm gonna be standing, patient's right here in front of us. This mayo stand is over the patient's legs and I'm gonna be able to just pull my forceps right, up, right across, right across. It's not a big deal, right across. It's a little different if there's place somewhere else. Again, though, same with the back table and the working field. If I'm going to be on, if I'm, if I know I'm going to be working on the left side of the patient, everything is backwards. So everything's going on to this side. These instruments are going over here. These scissors are going over here. It's opposite because you're going to be pulling up on the other side of the patient, and you want all of those instruments to be closer to you, easily accessible. That's the whole point of setting up your back table is you want these instruments and these sutures and these blades, everything, it just needs to be easily accessible. Now, one thing that a preceptor taught me when I was learning how to be a surgical tech, the thing that stuck with me the most was one, one preceptor taught me this. He said, Shane, when you look at your Mayo and you're looking at your instrumentation, make sure that the grouping is right. And I was like, grouping, what do you mean? Just having like all my needle holders together or having all of my clamps together? And he goes, no, it's more than that. It's, it's about functional grouping. You know, it's, it's making sure that your needle holders are close to your suture that they're gonna be used with. You know, there's no reason to have all of your needle holders on this side of the mayo and all of your suture on this side of the mayo. And you're gonna have, you know, we have this huge distance why not just have all of your suture and all of your needle holders together in one area on your mayo? Again, blades together, uh, scissors together, functional grouping, things that work together, that are going in the patient and that are working together, group them together on your mayo stand and you won't lose them. Coming back to blades, sharps, a lot of, uh, People do sharps a lot of different ways. Uh, I see people, I'm not gonna put a blade on here, but this is a knife handle. I see people <clears throat> take their towel, they may lift up their towel and put the sharp underneath their towel. I personally don't like that because I can't see the sharp physically, so I don't know exactly where it is. Yes, it's under a towel and it could be protected, Still, it, it just bothers me that I can't see a sharp physically. So I will just put them 
on the bottom corner of the, of the Mayo stand, every single time. This bottom corner, every single time. And I think it's important to always keep your sharps in the same exact place. Repetition, repetition is key with sharps. You want, that, you want to be placing your needles on the needle magnet, you want to be placing your blades in the same exact place. Either on your working, like, you know, right next to your working field on the back table, or on the bottom corner of your mayo stand when you're going to be using sharps. It's so important. You do not want to get stuck with a blade. It's happened to me before. It sucks. It's scary. I don't want it to happen to you. End of story. Okay. All right. Those are some good little pearls of wisdom. Tell me some takeaways. You can either use the chat or you can shout it out. The roll towel on the Mayo stand. Uh, for bigger cases, it really does seem like a good, great idea. It is. It is totally a great idea. You really can't live without it if you're you're putting so many ringed instruments up there. Functional grouping, yep, for sure. It just makes sense to group things together that you'll be using together on your back table as well, you know, uh, as on your mayo stand. I always keep my sharps closest to me, no matter what. I, I um, you guys will see my setup eventually. We'll get there. Um, yeah, I think it's the safest way. Dividing the back table into thirds. Yeah, dividing the back table into thirds. And if you can think of when you're setting up the back table of it being in thirds, where you set up this section, then you move to this section, then you move to this section, it's going to help you start to get into that groove of not moving things around multiple times. Like, figure out where things live. And there's different ways that you can do this because you're not gonna be in the lab all the time doing setups. So something that I suggest is draw it out. Get a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper, draw out your back table on one side, flip it, draw your mayo stand out on another or have two separate pages. But for, for me, drawing it out helps me to make a general plan. Like when I set up my back table and my mayo stand, the instruments might change and some of the supplies I have might change, but for the most part, I could close my eyes and you could ask me for anything and I could reach and get it because I always put those things in the same place. Unless, well, like he was saying, depending on if you're on the right or the left of the patient, your working area, which I call the kitchen, could be on one end or it could be on the other end right? And then how you kind of line up things on your mayo stand. Those could be mirror images of each other. So we need some forethought when we're getting ready to set up and, and we know that the patient is having a right inguinal hernia repair. What side are we going to be standing on? More than likely. The left. The left. Why? Because the surgeon's on the right. Exactly. <clears throat> Maybe they might let us do surgery at some point, but um, at this point we have to assume that they're going to want to do it. So that means we're going to be on the other side. If it's a left breast biopsy, we're going to be on the right. If it's a right knee replacement, we're more than likely going to be on the left. So we have to have that foresight going into our setup so that when we do set up and we move up to the field, we don't have everything backwards of the way that we would like it. Okay, so that's an important thing to think about. Yep, repetition. Repetition is, is the name of the game, isn't it? Um, so drawing it out really helps. You can draw out your basic mayo stand, you can draw out your basic back table. Um, I actually in the lab have what I have termed as um, set up paper dolls. And so I have cut everything out of paper that you can imagine that could be used to set up. Um, and when there's downtime, the thought is, is that if you're not engaged in an activity in the lab, you go get the paper dolls and you go through the motions of setting things up. Instruments go here, sponges go here, basin goes here, you know, and it's, it's very generalized, 
but it helps you hone your craft because because you want to get to a point where um, in my past life we would do at the end before students went out our checkoff was a little bit different than it is here a five minute breast biopsy setup so from the time the student turned their gown remember the dancing so from the time you touch your table you have five minutes to be ready to do the case. That means you have to be counted, you have to have your fluids, everything has to be labeled and you are set up for the surgeon to walk in and go. Now we usually don't do emergency breast biopsy setups, but this was to help hone your craft. And so one of my, my classes said, um, I had an instructor working with me, his name is Gary. And um, so they wanted um, he and I to race against each other to see who could go faster. And uh, we raced the first time and I beat him by like 30 seconds. I think I was three, three minutes, 45 seconds. And then we went a second time and he closed that gap. I think I went down to like 330 and he was like 345. And uh, I said, I'm not racing again. That's it, I'm done. <laughs> I think you're gonna catch me in the third round. But um, you want to get to a point where you just know where things go and you don't have to think about it. Yeah. What else? Other observations before I give you a little bit of a break? Forceps and scissors should be easily accessible. Yep. For sure. And not only thinking about grouping things together, but how we um, orient them on the Mayo stand. You know, how he talked about forceps. Forceps are right here on this side. I'm gonna be standing here and it's just an easy pass. Not just where you place them, but how you orient them. Is the little tweezer end going this way or is the little tweezer end going that way? Is the scalpel facing this way or is it facing that way? I always say put the butts to the surgeon, right? So the back of the forcep, the back of the blade. So all you have to do is what I call the pick up and pass. You pick it up and you pass it like this. You don't have to twirl it like a baton. You don't have to contort yourself to get it, right? You can just do this. And that's what it should be. It should be to the surgeon's hand exactly how they want it so they can use it. Right? And so that, that forethought of thinking about how it gets positioned on the Mayo stand also comes into play, which we will practice. For um, me, I like seeing him stand actually between the Mayo and the back table because in my brain, I was like kind of having a hard time with that. Like, where are we at in the world? So that was kind of cool. Yes. Um, we're typically standing at the back end of the mayo stand. So when, um, for you to be able to drape your mayo stand, it has to be that part, the tray that's sticking out, right? Has to be there so that you can slip the cover on. But we actually stand at the opposite side, which I refer to as the back. So the front of the mayo stand is where you drape it. And then you're gonna stand at the back side. So what I do is after I drape my mayo stand, I turn it around because in my brain, that helps me orient where I'm going to be. I'm going to be standing at the back of this mayo stand. Now, some people like that and it's really helpful and other people don't and that's fine. Like there's more than one way to get from A to B for sure. Um, if you're going to be standing on um, this side of the patient and not the side, the far side, then turning that mayo stand around can get kind of confusing because then you have to think about, okay, I'm going to be standing here and I'm going to be turning around and then, okay, this is where I need to put my stuff. But for me, it works. Um, and you guys can find what works um, for you. But we're always going to be standing near that back side. Um, Let's see. Oh, my opinion of the blade being under the towel. I agree with him. I don't like my sharps being hidden. That makes me feel nervous. Now, some surge techs, they keep them on their back table altogether and never bring them to the Mayo. And I get that, right? Because it's kind of out, out of harm's way. 
but then you have to go to your back table to get the very first thing that you're going to pass to your surgeon. And in my mind, that doesn't make sense to me. But if it's in your working area, essentially it should just be down to your table here. I know you can't see me. Pick up and pass, right? It shouldn't be like, oh, wait, well, I'll be right back. Let me go get that blade, right? Um, you want to have it like really close to you. So it's just like, here you go. Um, I have the same feeling with sponges. I know that like Miss Jackson, um, she teaches the students to only put up two sponges which drives me crazy. But that's how she was trained and that's what she does. But sponges are like the bread and butter of surgery. So why would you only put up two when in 10 minutes you're gonna have to go to your back table to get more? And then I was raised in a facility that was very small. And so it was just my surgeon and I. And if my sponges are on my back table and I'm holding retractors, and the surgeon needs another sponge, who gets it? I have to drop my retractors. Surgery has to stop. I have to go to my back table to get something that I know the surgeon uses throughout every single surgery. So that doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to some people. And that, that's why I say there's, there's such a variation. It's just really like what makes sense to you and what helps you work most eff uh, effectively. But then I also had a surgeon I worked with that um, would nip at you if you went to your back table too frequently. So those, all of those things kind of shaped me, right? If I was working in a bigger facility where I'm like the fourth person down and I'm like, um, hey, can you pass this down to the surgeon and three people touch it before it gets to the surgeon? Why do I even need to have a mayo stand? Like I can just work off the back table, right? So it really depends. Um, let me see what Ariana said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my face gives things away lots of times. Yes, so um, typically when we're talking about reusing instruments, that's a great question. Um, one thing that we learned from our principals is just isolating that skin blade. And so that's something we kind of already learned, but we'll definitely practice that. And then for the most part, everything else can stay in play unless it becomes contaminated. Um, and ways it would become contaminated, it falls on the floor, okay, it's out of play. Or it, whatever else happens to it, it needs to be isolated. It gets used in an area that's considered contaminated, like it cuts the appendix, it cuts into the bowel, it goes into the vaginal canal, like I mentioned with the hysterectomy. Then those things would be isolated. So as we go through those um, particular specialties and we practice those particular cases, we'll definitely practice, um, you know, we'll, we'll know what's dirty. We'll know how we separate it. We'll know what to separate um, and those sorts of things. So yes, absolutely, we will. Yep, good question. I like the suture towel too, Hannah. Um, I kind of do a similar thing that he does, but I will leave my blue towel folded and it goes kind of in the front corner opposite of like where my field is. Um, and I will, um, if you have more sutures, then laying it out long definitely works. But when you don't have too many, you can still use it like that. I stick my sutures under there just like he does. I think he's probably like my surge tech soulmate. Um, and then um, I take my needle holder and I load my first two stitches always, my first two stitches, and I lay them there on my blue towel. And I'll show you guys how, how I do that and what my setup looks like. But that way, like I have my first two stitches ready to go. They're right here, they're loaded. And then um, I like to put half of my little, the little red thing, I always break it in half and put half on my back table and half up on my mayo stand. Um, so. Anyways, but that's just me. Um, definitely not gonna get like points off or anything like that if you're doing something a little bit different. As long as it's efficient, you don't contaminate and it's not dangerous. Those are the things I care about the most.
Alexis, I like your question. Does the surgeon or someone else mess with the mayo like when they throw instruments up there or grab? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. Um, a lot of times they will just take whatever instruments they have, they'll toss them on the mayo stand or they'll toss them like, mm, I guess what would be the patient's lap if they were sitting up, right? Like right there where their legs kind of come together. <laughs> Um, because a lot of times that's kind of where we're working and they'll just kind of put instruments there and it's our responsibility to gather those up and put them back on the mayo stand um, in an orderly fashion. The more you can stay organized, then the more efficient you're going to be able to work. Um, so any second that you have where you're not engaged with the surgical team, you want to be tidying up. Right. If it, there's a dirty sponge on the field, get rid of that. Get a clean sponge out. Um, if the instruments look really sticky and bloody and gross, you know, get some sterile water. Get a sponge. Clean them off. Whatever the case may be, organize things. Um, but sometimes, yeah, they definitely will. Um, you'll have surgeons that like to grab off the mayo stand too. Um, I've never been one of those surge techs that like get angry when somebody grabs off my mayo stand, but I know there are some that do and will literally tell the surgeon, do not touch my mayo stand. But I've never really been like that. Um, I'm not really that territorial. I did work with one surgeon that did not want you to pass anything to him. And I don't know what shaped him to be that way, if he was injured, if he injured someone else, if that's just the way he was trained. Um, but you literally, he was a neurosurgeon. You would set up your mayo stand and you, you'd be there and he'd just grab off the mayo stand, throw things back onto the mayo stand and you were so, you were just like the housekeeper. You know, you had the stuff, you were the housekeeper, you cleaned it, you put it back in line. Uh, and then he just, you know, it was a buffet. Yeah. I've actually used that line before when <sighs> pull the mayo stand up and you have a hundred other things to do. You're like, it's a buffet. Just help yourself. I got to get this ready. Uh, so, you know, feel free. Uh, so yeah, you know, they, they span the gamut. That's for sure. And then you'll have some surgeons that are like, you know, those boyfriends or husbands that you're like, Hey, can you get into my purse and grab my wallet? And they're like, um, here's your purse. Like, I don't, I don't go in there. Uh, I'm not going in. I'm like, it's no big deal. It's just my wallet. Just grab it out. It's like, no. Um, and so there's some surgeons that are like that where you're like, you know, just go ahead. And they're like, oh, no, mm -mm. no, that's, that's your territory. Uh, I'll just wait. So, you know, it just depends. You just got to learn them and then um, just go with that. Good question. Anything else? I like it. It's always fun as talking about surgeries. Um, I noticed that his back table wasn't covered with towels, but typically we'll put towels like under the tray. You'll put towels down where you're gonna bring your instruments out and put a towel under like where your sharps and your wet, wet stuff is gonna be. Um, so typically most surge techs will cover most of their table with towels. That's just kind of a thing, just like that extra barrier. And we're always going to put a towel up on the mayo stand as well, one if not two, depending on how big the mayo stand is. Um, and that's pretty much across the board. One exception I can think of is when you're doing eyeballs. When you're doing eyeballs, you don't want to put a towel up there because even though those towels are supposed to be lint-free, some lint can get on the instruments. There's a possibility, right? And you don't want lint on those eye instruments. And so we will forego the towel when we do eyeballs. Okay, um, I'm, I, I'm seeing that like blank stare look. So let me give you a break. That's a lot of information to take in. Um, it looks like it's 11 o'clock, so uh, let's take 10 minutes, and then our first up for presentation is going to be Robbie, and then Hannah is going to follow, and Rulon and Adriana. So that's our one Robbie, two Hannah, three Rulon, four Adriana. So we'll see where we're at after that, okay? So I will see you in about 10 minutes. Thank mm -hmm. you.